Good morning. Happy Saturday. You all know the routine. This is a live broadcast of the Live and Share podcast where we have honest conversations about faith and leadership. And today's conversation is no different. I'm always interviewing successful individuals who are sharing their industry knowledge, their expertise, and they're always adding the secret sauce about their faith. So today's conversation, I have a very special guest. We'll be talking about how to be our brother's keeper in vulnerable times. So make sure you share this video. Do me a favor, start a watch party so your friends and followers can join in on this conversation. And those of you that are catching the replay, hit replay so I can go back in and say hello to you. As you pop in, say hello. Tell me where you are watching from. I am your host, your girl, Marilyn Shaw. I cannot wait to bring on our special guest to talk about how to be our brother's keeper in times of vulnerability. This is some great information that you will need, especially especially in the times that we're living in right now. So many people need to have hope. They need to have strategy. They are just like, I don't know what to do. So the podcast is here for you to give that insight on how to provide support to our fellow brothers. So that way they understand that we are there for them. They're not alone, that we hear them and we are stepping up as much as possible so do me a favor, make sure you share. My special guest will be added to the conversation very shortly and also start a watch party. Cannot wait for you guys to tune in and make sure you comment if you have any questions that you want to present to us. If we can't get them in today's conversation, we'll be sure to get back to you, especially um, and I really appreciate every last one of you for tuning in. So my special guest will be added very, very shortly. Cannot wait to talk about how to be our brother's keeper in vulnerable times. How many of you can relate that right now you just kind of feel like the world is naked? <laughs> Everything is just being exposed and it's so easy to be defensive and put up walls and not want to show who we are. But when you're vulnerable, that's the time to really start to dig in deep. And to go through the process of healing. And I really feel like this world that we're living in will go through that process. And we need to have strategies on how to do it from a perspective of hope, not a perspective of fear, not of anxiousness, not of worry. And to know that God has a plan for all of us. Every last one of us have a purpose to serve. And this podcast is the platform to share that purpose. So we're going to be adding on our special guest. He's known as the Hope Diller, and he has so much insight, so much wisdom, and he uses his voice and gift to share with the world. Good morning. How's it going? I am well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the podcast. Everyone, this is my special guest, Frank Brady. He is an award-winning poet. He's an educator and a youth engagement specialist. And the most amazing thing about his talent is that he travels the world sharing his gift of wisdom to the youth, young and old, and letting them know that there is hope. He's known as the hope dealer. So thank you so much, Frank, for being on with today's conversation for the Live and Share podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. Is, is every, so I want to make sure everything is clear. I had a little technical You are absolutely clear. You can, yes. see me, you can see me clear as well. You are good. Yes. Uh-oh. There we go. It's Here we go. Good. You're so, ready? Yes, I am ready. I am ready. I awesome. want to make sure I was all good. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's how technology goes. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but the message is still going to get across. Yes, indeed. So today's conversation, as I shared with the listeners before, that we're going to be talking about how to be our brother's keeper in vulnerable times. And I feel like the world that we're living in right now. There are so many people that have put up walls in defense, which I totally understand because everything that we've been experiencing behind the scenes is coming to the forefront to the world. But our black men in particularly, our young men 
also they're now having to show their most vulnerability and now we need to know what can we do so take a moment to share with us from your perspective what are some avenues of hope that we can provide to our young black men right um you know when thinking about helping our young black men right now especially if we're talking like adolescents one of the pieces is we have to be able to give our young men the tools to process what they are dealing with, right? Um, emotional processing is, is, is essential. And a lot of times, especially as young men, I mean, older men, we have trouble processing our emotions. So the younger generation, they need to have, they need to be able to have safe spaces to be able to talk about what's happening around them. I would say right. that's one. Two, um, a lot sometimes with young men you have to you have to allow them to be vulnerable without telling them asking them to be vulnerable like you mm. just have to talk to them because a lot of times young men um are programmed to run from that vulnerability or feeling of emotion um as a sign of weakness but a lot of times in just general conversations once they trust you they'll open up to you and and, and share you know so outlets to at least that emotional pressure i think is one thing and then i'd say three um allowing them to be able to acknowledge that, you know, they are feeling some, it could be fear, it could be anxiety, right? Um, and letting them right. know that it's okay to feel that, you know, and that it's not just, um, it's not common to just, just um, a few, few types of, of men, that all men feel that, you know, I would say four, make sure that there are other men around him, older men, you know, um, what are the space, and then you know you can figure out what are the spaces that that young men, the young men open up to, you know. Right. Um, I I always say you know if if every man every young man goes to a barber, sometimes the barbers are the most therapeutic spaces out there, you know. So maybe after you get after a young man gets his hair cut or something like that, if you have a child, talk to the barber and say, hey, look, he's going through boom boom boom. Um, you know, you never know. Barbers are real therapeutic. You know, so that's a, that's right. a couple of couple of um, pieces I have, but emotional processing is is the most important piece, and showing them that it's okay to do that as a man. From a cultural standpoint, I mean, for years, especially in the black community, it hasn't been necessarily acceptable to be vulnerable in that time or to show your emotion. And right. I feel like the times that we're living in now, we have this opportunity to stand in the gap for our black men, for them to be heard, to be seen, and to let them know that we're there for them. So as we're creating these safe spaces for them to let out their emotions, what are some of the processes after the fact? Because just like with anyone that goes through healing, they may feel like, okay, this hurts, this is trauma, but instead of them packing down those feelings and emotions, how can they still be productive and move forward and allow their voices to be heard? Hmm. That's a very good question. Hmm. I think it really starts with this, right? Um, where do we allow black men to channel the energy or channel, you know, what happens after the, we, we, we process? I think that's important, right? And I think I think this 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 goes into um, productive coping mechanisms or coping measures, right? Right. So, for instance, you know, after you're angry, after you acknowledge the fact that you're angry, after you acknowledge the fact that you're hurt, after you acknowledge the fact that you're you have you're going through things that you're having trouble like putting language to, right? After you do all of that, now I think it comes on you to say, okay, now how do I channel that? You know, like. How do I productively start to impact the issue that's been impacting me? Mm -hmm. So, well, let's just say whether it is right now where we are in, in the country where, you know, we are dealing with the issues of police um, brutality um, and, and, and black men seeing black men killed on camera over and over is a very traumatic thing. And it does something to anyone's mind psychologically. It does something. Um, but to particularly to black men, you see yourself. You can see yourself in there because generally a lot of times we have a very trauma trauma um trauma related response to police they're a very big trigger for us 
based on culturally, based on how we grew up, based on our interactions with police officers. Um, and so I would say if, if that's the issue, then maybe you, you, they're encouraged to get involved in the community and protest and activism, um, you know, in, 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 in learning. I think that's another piece, right? Once you know what hurts you, you have to learn why it hurts you, where the hurt mm. is coming from, where the root of the hurt is going on at, and what is your part in that? So a lot of times, I would say uh, most black men that I speak to don't know the origins of, let's just say, police and everything like that, and policing in America. Um, and I say to, under, like, you know, do some research and understand the origins in the North versus the South, how the South had the slave um, catch and patrol as the origins of our modern day policing in terms of, um, you know, and how the armed militias, like, understand the history um, and why it was put into place. I mean, knowledge is a very powerful tool, right? I think it, it gives it gives emotion a trajectory and a pathway to be guided to become productive. So now once you mm. understand that, that piece from the, the historical part, now start to learn about the systemic issues, right? Because it's one thing to yell and be upset, but you need to know why you're upset. You're not just upset because your environment, that's one thing and what's happening to you. You're upset because there is a deeper set of underlying issues in a system that has been propagated to, to breathe the symptoms, which is the, the, the situation you grew up in, whether the in a city, where there's low economics, there's a system that's, that, that's capitalizing off of you. Understand what that is, right? It, you know, you're mad about your environment. Okay. Understand what is the government programming um, of redlining and how they used to redline districts that would force you know, housing companies and, 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 and um, um, loan companies with, and with banks would redline these less desirable it, districts and place people into those districts, right? Deny mm -hmm. people home loans and everything like that to place. And generally, there are black and brown people. Understand that, right? Um, understand how, understand, like, where the violence is stemming from in your, your community, Right, not just internally, right? Like, what are the outside factors? So I'm really big on under, you know, that 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 knowledge piece, because it makes right. you now start to focus your energy, right? Productive, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And having focus energy does produce productivity. You're now taking the knowledge, the information that you have. You went from being angry and upset to not bottling it in. Yes. And taking more information and saying, this is how I can be productive. This is how I can, you know, make an impact on my community. This yes. is how I can stop the cycles from continuing to happen among our generation. And what's so interesting to me is with your platform, you've made your mission to go out and speak powerful words through poetry, through um, speaking engagements, to educate people and to give them hope to see beyond their circumstances. I want you to share for a moment, why did you take that on as your personal mission to be the hope dealer? Wow, thank you. Um... To be honest and transparent, the reason why I took that mission on is because I saw a gap, right? Um, it all stemmed back from my childhood, you know, growing up in the inner city, you know, um, the ghetto, as we call it, the terminology we label it, right? And learning that, you know what, wow, there's a lot of things that are affecting me and are affecting my peers, and I never understood it. And I was a very angry young man when I was younger, like extremely angry. And I didn't know necessarily where that anger stemmed from. It wasn't until my latter years I would know that, okay, lack of a father figure, that was one. Um, traumatic situations in my community, issues with, you know, young men that look like me, bullying, gangs, you know. Um, and I, and I, from a young age, I wonder, well, why is this happening to me specifically? Like, you know, I went to a, I, I went to a, a really good school, you know, starting in my middle school years, but I lived in the hood. And I was like, I would wonder, well, why is there a difference between here, the, the individuals here that are in the school, and when I go back home? And when I would visit my friends' houses at the school, I would say, well, why do you have, why is your neighborhood quiet? You know, I don't see any police around your neighborhood, right? After nine o'clock, it's quiet, it's silence. I don't know what crooked sound like like that. Why is it here and yet? So I, I used to see these disparities and these differences. And I said, look, well, there's, there's this issue of a divide here, right? 
And, you know, then I would see in my community, you know, with, with drugs being sold and advent to that. And I'm an 80s baby. Right. So I remember, you know, the out the aftermath of crack. And I remember walking in the projects and, and, and literally walking over people on the ground, like just sitting, leaning, didn't know what it was, didn't know that they were addicted back then. That was a child. Right. All of these images and these disparities. Right. And I think because of that, because of my need to understand my culture, the culture I grew up in, the culture I, 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 I was born into and placed into, realized that I didn't necessarily have a choice of what I was born into and placed into. I was just given a deck of cards, a hand, you know, and say, here's the a deck of cards. Here's your hand. You just play what you get. And as I got older and I left New York and I got to, I moved to Connecticut and I realized, man, it's so different in Connecticut. I mean, and I thought Connecticut was real, like, quiet and soft and stuff. And then I went around New Haven, the Hartfords, the Bridgeports. And I said, well, so it, there's inner city issues everywhere. It's not just specific to one state, one community. And then I started connecting it with poverty, right? And I, I realized that because of my experience on both sides of the fence, because I knew it was a comp in, a, in an impoverished um, community and neighborhood, and because I also knew what it was to, like, see, see suburbia in action, and see you know, the difference between the haves and the have-nots, right? And to see that on a bigger scale, as I started to learn about how government worked, um, you know, how money works, right? I said, man, you know, I want to be a bridge between the two, right? Like, mm -hmm. I want to I be able to literally sit, take my brothers and my sisters that are struggling and say, okay, here's the rules of the game. This is how we get from point A to point B because we don't have to stay in point A just because we were placed in point A, right? right? And so I started to just really become like an urban sociologist, right? Like an urban anthropologist. Like I just started to really study my culture and the contributing factors to why, right? And then the archetypal figure of the drug dealer really caught my attention because, you know, the classic mm. story of that's who had the attention, that's who had the girls, the cars, right? When I was coming up um, and I realized that this, okay, slinging hope, dope, and, you know, one day it just came at me. I was writing this poem and I said, you know, oh, my faith is Christian. And I was talking about Christ being a, a, a dope healer. And then Hope Dealer just came to me and I was mm. like, that sound good. And then I realized I had a big brother, my big brother um, influence, man. He's a, he's a dope, he's an amazing poet. He's one of the first um, poetic concerts I ever went to, CD releases when I was a teenager. And he had this poem called A Poetry Dealer, Right. And he kind of embodied a man that had turned his life around and used to sling dope and now slings hope. And that poetry dealer stuck with me. And it was those combination, co combination and confluence of things that led me to say hope dealer, right? And I just started going by that monologue and I pushed dreams and, and, and sling hope. You know, um, I'm trying to change, help people change their situations in their lives, right? Um, I do that with youth, anyone I can, especially in my community, Right, like helping people improve economically, being a bridge to resources. A lot of times, there's so many resources out there for us, but because it's, it's hidden in plain sight in books, or it's hidden in internet research, or it's hidden in, in terminology that we can't necessarily process and understand because that's not our language, I try and translate that and break it down. Just try and connect all um, my people to opportunities. I love that, and I think what's so interesting is that sometimes we can take our situation and start to live and reproduce, or we can look at it from a perspective of saying, I wanna be the solution. I wanna be that gap that you were talking about filling in. You were able to look at your community and to find the areas of opportunity to say, people glorify and look at someone that's slinging drugs as someone as the next person that I want to be. That is their image of hope. But yet you took that perspective through your faith to now say, I'm going to produce a hope dealer. I'm going to impact the lives of so many people for them to see their greatest potential, even if they're living in the area that doesn't represent where they're wanting to go. Right. They're now able to hear the words, the gifts and talents that have been placed on the inside of you to now be able to move out of that situation. I want you to share the power of using your gifts through faith. Oh, Sometimes word. people underestimate that and look at it from a religious perspective mm -hmm. of just going to church and whatever our culture has been for so long. But now you've literally taken your gift 
and have used it to influence people like T.D. Jakes, Black Enterprise, and the list goes on and on and on. Tell us about the power of using our gifts beyond what's traditional. Well, I think I learned from Jesus. Jesus wasn't traditional. Jesus was a carpenter, right? He was an activist. You know, um, he was a, a community leader. He was a community organizer, right? And there are so many lessons biblically that we can take from that. Jesus knew leadership. You know what I'm saying? Jesus, right. Jesus took 12 unknown guys, right, and made a team. And each of them had a different job that they were assigned to. And what he just said, come and follow me. That means he was so persuasive and what, what he walked with was so powerful. You got 10, 10 minutes, 12 minutes to drop their, whatever they're doing and say, follow me. That's, that's persuasive leadership. That means you have to be that dope and that compelling that it's right. like your reputation speaks for itself, right? Um, beyond your exploits. That's one thing, right? I would say, you know, he was a carpenter. And I think the practical aspect of that is that if Jesus was a carpenter, I'm like, if I'm chilling in a chair right now that Jesus made, it'd probably be the most flyest, smoothest, like it'd probably be the first wood chair that you couldn't sit in because you slide out of it because it's been so crafted so sleekly, the cover, the paint, everything, perfection. And I would say that he took time to master, and Joseph, his father, taught him carpentry as, as a skill, right? So he took time to master his craft as a carpenter, right? To then to like really probably to perfection, right? And it shows us like 10,000 hours, put the work into your gift, right? Right. And the Bible says the gift, your gift will make room for you and bring you before great men, right? So you need to have a, a strong master gift. And once you master the gift, it's going to open doors for you like all over the place. But if you don't develop the gift, and sometimes God will give us these blessings and these talents, but we don't turn the talents into a gift, right? Right. Um, or, yeah, or I say the gift into a skill, if you want to put it like that, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm also a, a, a firm believer that, you know, a friend of mine says that, um, she's a therapist, she says, we are all uniquely born to solve a problem, right? Mm -hmm. And when we learn the problem that we were born to solve, we know that, you know, Bible talks about, you know, my sheep will hear my voice, you know, and everybody has a set of sheep that's called to them based on what their gift is, right, and what their talent is, right? It can mm -hmm. be our stories, our testimonies, you know, it could be the way we clean, right? And all of those gifts are ministries too, you know what I'm saying? Um, and I'm real, I'm real, like, start, like, just real basic, right? Like, I look at it like all those ways are ways to help people, right, with all right. of our, our right. gifts, just to help people, to help people live on this earth, to get by, to empower them, right? Right. And faith without work is without works is dead. So Absolutely. you have to put the work in your faith. And I feel like, you know, um, you know, when, when the Bible talks about, you know, um, um with 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 um if I be lifted up, I'll draw men to thee, right? I think that also you can look at that also from the stat where it's like how you lift up God is by honoring the gift that He has given you and mm -hmm. and, and and being a good steward of that gift, right? Stewardship is a principle, being a great steward of that gift. And once you are a great steward of that gift, that gift becomes stronger. And if you could take over, take care of, let's just say, 10% of that gift and you, you grow it, then it's going to triple to 30%, 50, you know what I'm saying, then double to 60 right. before it's matured to 90%. And you get more territory because you can handle more, right? And I think people in the world need to see that if you are a believer, you've got to sharpen to cultivate your gift so you can solve these issues and solve these problems. You know what I'm saying? And I think that will also help them I'll be honest and transparent. That is one of the pieces that helps people with their faith. It's seeing mm -hmm. tangible manifestations and actions that are attributed to, to taking the, 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 the God, the Bible, the basic principles before leaving earth, those basic pieces, right? The, all the scriptures and putting them into action to solve the issues that are impacting us in this world, right? And then mm -hmm. that's going to change people's situations. You know what I'm saying? Actions speak louder than words, you know what I'm saying? But words should be the, guide, the guidance to the actions we take. And we got this whole 66 books of words that can guide the actions we take that can improve people's situations, right? Absolutely. Like, Jesus had many gifts, you know what I'm saying? But as an organizer, 
He said, look, we're going to do this. We're going to take 5,000. We're going to take these 5,000 people, right? I'm going to talk to them. Before I talk to them and, and feed their spirit, I know they're hungry. You know, we talk about poverty. They could, they could have been in some real extreme poverty. And he's like, you know what? Here's some loaves of, loaves of bread. Here's some fish. Y'all take this. Boom, 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 boom. I'm going to use this. My charisma. I'm going to gather y'all, but I'm going to feed y'all too at the same time. Right? And then now that I met a need, I think it's about meeting people's needs. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, I'm very practical. Right. Like, meet somebody's needs, man. Like, I'm a firm believer. You have to sharpen your gift and make it be a blessing to people. Like, um, my, my, my pastor, um, Pastor Ty Foster, always taught me to be, um, make the God difference in people's lives, right? Mm -hmm. And from my personal experience, I've learned that sometimes when people are praying for things, they're really asking God, and God taps you on the shoulder like, yo, that person needs that. You have that. That person is asking for that. I'll get, put you in a position to be able to help this person at this per time so they can know that I'm still listening to their prayers and I'm answering their prayers. And sometimes mm. that gets uncomfortable because you're like, yo, God, why are you asking me to do this? Like, I don't know this person. But then the Bible talks about, yo, I prepare with the man's heart before we even come. So for me, right. it's just like, okay, I've been in situations where it's like, okay, God, like, you said just to give, go over there and buy that person a soda or something. Okay. And they say, yo, I was just praying for this. That's crazy. You came over here, you know, wow. or, or, or I, I, I mean, I had some multiple situations, you know what I'm saying? And you never know what I'm telling you. This, this is something solid. Like when God asks you to do something and you wonder it, sometimes you just don't got to wonder. You just got to do it because you never know whose life is attached to your yes and whose life could be changed. Literally. Absolutely. Because people think that God don't answer prayers. It's not that God don't answer prayers. It's just, people that God tell to do things don't answer what he's asking them to do. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, if you have the power Absolutely. to change someone's situation and you don't, you, you were given that for a reason. You were given the platform. You were given the money. You were given the access to resources. You were given all those things, not to hoard them for yourself, but to make someone else's life better. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Um, make believer, make believers. One of the two. That is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And to hear you talk about, it's very practical that sometimes we make things so much more than what it really is. And I like how you reference that we try to hoard our gifts for ourselves. We're checking off the boxes of accomplishments. We're doing all these different things. And then we feel like it's just for our own personal gain. It's just for us to share on social media mm -hmm. when the reality is we're sent here on this earth to make an impact yes. on someone else's life. And it goes back to the premise of our conversation of how to be our brother's keeper yes. in vulnerable times. If someone is vulnerable, if someone is hurting, they're dealing with trauma, your gifts are the solution to those areas that they needed the most. Mm -hmm. So as we're coming to a close with our conversation, I want you to leave some words of inspiration and hope for those that feel lost, that feel like the world is coming to an end, that their gifts are not valuable. But even if their circumstance, what they see in front of them looks different from where they want to go, there is still hope for their future. Right. Man, I would say, man, first and foremost, just trust in the Lord, man, and, 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 you know, write the vision and make it plain. Sometimes when you're at the bottom, this is the best time for you to, to hear, hear where God's telling you, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and it, means, it means what's the vision for your life? Like, what do you want? I'm, I'm practical. Like, I say it all the time, man. I learn to be practical. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, that's one tool I'm thankful that, you know, the, the people in my life, um, my, my pastor, my big bro taught me be practical. Like, you know what I'm saying? Faith without works is dead. So it's like, even when you feel like you're at the bottom, hey, you could climb out. There's people that have done it. So I would say, first right. of all, can find stories of people that have overcome and start to put that, pump that, listen to that all constantly. What are the clues and how they overcome came their situations and got out their problems, right? I would say, two, start to learn and educate yourself in personal development. Like six months can catapult your life six years. Six months of focus on yourself can catapult your life for six years forward, right? Like what are those spaces in your side of yourself that, you know, did anything of your decisions get you to where you are right now? You know, take the time. Why are you at the bottom? So that when you get back to the top, you know how to stay there. 
because you have a foundation. Mm. So start to do that internal work, right? Like, why am I here? What made me get here? Because sometimes we just end up in situations and we don't sit down and reflect and understand how we got here. Because if you don't understand your history, you're doomed to repeat it. So you have to sit down and reflect on how you got where you got to, right? So you cannot make the same mistakes or the same mistakes can't be made and impact you because you can now see the issues coming before they come. Um, I would say also, yo, look at what resources are around to, to help you out. You know what I'm saying? When I, you know, I always say to people, man, I went from EVT to BET for a reason. When I was at my lowest, man, I, you know, I had some sinus issues. I was still on EVT, right? Uh, right before I got on BET, literally. Oh, wow. literally. EBT to BET. I said that 10 years ago. And sometimes there's only lessons. And then also, there's some lessons you can't learn at the top. There's only lessons in life you only learn at the bottom. Like, pain is the ultimate mirror. It's going to show you who you are under pressure. It's going to show mm-hmm. you how to grow. It's going to show you how you have to develop. It's going to show you yourself, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it's time to take an inventory of what the ugly is and start to address that. You know, um, I'm telling you, trauma is a powerful behind thing, man. Yeah. Trauma. And, and sometimes when we get the bottom, we don't realize that sometimes it's a re- result based on decisions we've made based on how our trauma could have impacted us. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, think about right. trauma. Trauma is like someone comes and, you know, you, you're in the driver's seat of your life. And then whatever experiences you didn't had happen to you and uh, um, impact you, they say, nah, get out the driver's seat, go to the passenger, or go to the back seat. I'm driving this car now, right? Mm-hmm. You, can, you can be a back seat driver. You can tell me where, to, but I'm driving this car now. And when I'm driving, I'm going to make sure that you react to your triggers, right? I'm going to make sure that, you know, you don't understand why you don't value, like you value personal space, why you don't like somebody being too close to your bubble because something happened to you when you were younger that you never addressed. Make sure that you don't address that because I'm going to have you so caught up on the, the symptoms that I'm not going to have you get to the root of the problem and the issue. And then you're going to spend years living and trapped in cycles, repeating over and over and over again and wondering why you can't go nowhere because you haven't broke the cycle in your life. And we all got living difficult cycles that will self-perpetuate because then we become part of the cycle because we don't address. And what we don't reveal, we can't heal, Right. So it's like what you don't uncover, it's like, I look at it like this, right? Because when you're at the bottom, it's the perfect time to say, all right, I've had this cut. And I didn't realize how long I had this cut because I've had the cut so long that I'm numb to the pain. My body's adjusted mm-hmm. to it. I don't know life without, the, without the, the cut being open, right? But as that cut has been open, you dig. I look at it, it's, it's, it started as a little speck. But as I've grown, it's taken over more of my arm, more of my arm, more of my arm, more of my arm. I didn't, you know, it could have been a burn and I didn't have skin grafts, whatever it is, right? But there's toxic tissue in there that hasn't been cleaned out because it's just sat there to fester. And because I, I want to look good and, and sound like I'm good, I get the skin colored band aids and put it on there real quick. So you can't even tell. I look good. My arm look good. But beneath that, you take that band aid off. There are deeper wounds. There's a deep behind wound that's been gangrening, that's been rotten for years and years. That's been affecting my relationships. That's been affecting my work, uh, my friendships, my relationship with myself, right? All of these things. And the, being at the bottom is the perfect time to start to take that off and clean it out. Clean that thing out so that you can actually know what it's like to have a healthy arm. Because sometimes you're so intimate with your... And this is another thing, right? And I'm just going here because I feel like I'm flowing right now. Sometimes you can be so intimate with your pain. Pain is intimate, right? And, and, and it's dependable. You know what I'm saying? It's consistent. And sometimes when you haven't had consistency inside of your life, the only thing you know that is consistent is that pain. You can depend on it, right? You can depend on the pain to trigger you to make these negative coping mechanisms, whether they're sex, whether they're drugs, right? Whether it's work, you know what I'm saying? Avoidance, you know? Like, coping mechanism don't just mean the negative stuff. Even, you know, whether it's church, you know what I'm saying? You go, you can go sing in the choir, praise, boom, 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 but you still have that issue in that deep root, and it's just nullifying it and dulling it until it gets, and you can push it down and compact it until something triggers it and brings it up, and you got to find a way to cope with it, right? And I say that to say is that when you're at the bottom, just because you are there, you, you don't have to stay there. 
right? And, and, and action, action will produce results. It may not have a, a specific timetable, but you, the process will change you. And if you're at the bottom, you have to change your mindset. It's something that you, the way that you view life, right? You can shift and change. And then when you put, couple that with your faith, like God is the plug, man. God is the plug for real. And if you really seek him, you know what I'm saying, in a way that's genuine, I ain't talking nothing like religious, you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying like God, like for me, that's my dad. That's my pops. You know what I'm saying? Something like that. What's the, what is my issue? What do I need? What's, show me what's going on in here because I can't understand it, right? You know what I'm saying? I write letters to God all the time. You know what I mean? I wow. lo love letters. Sometimes when I need to express something, I just like, dear God, this is how I'm feeling. Boom, boom, boom. We get certain things out, right? Then I look, you know, you look in the Bible. The Bible is full of imperfect people that God used to do perfect things. You know what I'm saying? Like Noah was imperfect. I think he was a drunk. No, Moses was a drunk, something like that. You know, we all know about David. David was a whole adulterer. You know what I'm saying? Talk about hitting bottom. Joseph went, got it, Joseph got it through the mud. Like yeah. that, that, that dude was dragged. He got betrayed by a whole family. And a lot of people can identify with that, dragged through the mud. But you, then you see he was second in command after that as a result. You know? Yeah. Um, it's a relatability thing, right? Imperfect people. Peter, anger issues. He was Mike Tyson before there was Tyson. Right. He's taking ears off. You know what I'm saying? Like, but look at what he was used to do. You know, so I think when you're at the bottom, you have to do that self-reflection, couple that with your faith. And I, and I say that because that's what I've been able to do. Like, there's lessons you're only going to get when you're at the bottom. Like, when I've been at my lowest, that's when I've learned the most about myself because I'm exposed mm -hmm. now, right? I can't, I can't hide behind accolades. I can't front with accolades. I can't front with status and pomp because once it's in here and it's hurt, it's in here and it's hurt for real. So I can't go right. nowhere with that, right? So... I got to get real with myself. If I, I dealt with anxiety, depression, all of that because of undealt with issues because of cycles, I was self-perpetuating. Because once something happens right. to you and you don't heal it, you become part of your own problem because you still continue to execute the same behaviors that keeps you trapped in the cycle. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, you learn, I tell people all the time, like analyze your relationships in your life and how you interact with them. And the earliest relationships, you have to understand what is the relationship with your mother and your father. Or your caregivers, because those are the root of the relationships of how you deal with people in your life, right? Mm -hmm. For men, it's the, it could be the, the root of how you deal with women. You know, how you, if for men, it could be the root of how you deal with other men based on your relationship with your father, right? right. You know, understand those, because, you know, our adolescence is like our molding period, right? And that's mm -hmm. why a child is like a sponge at an early age, Right. And a lot of times we, we suffer from like what's called um, ACE, adverse childhood experiences, right? And those are the ones that kind of set us off into these cycles of traumatic reenactment. When I mean traumatic mm -hmm. reenactment, I mean that these experiences hurt us in a way and we don't know how to heal them or deal with them. And especially in the black community, therapy is not something that's talked about. Now it is. But when we was coming up, right. when we was younger, it's like, you crazy. Right. You know what I'm saying? And my mother, my right. mother got mental illness. You know what I mean? Like, mm. um, so you, we have these adverse child experiences that become part of that trauma that gets in the driver's seat of our life that if we don't deal with it, we don't reveal it and heal it, it just continually, you know what I'm saying, like pushes us in life and we're going forward, but we're stagnant. You know what I'm saying? Just because you're moving don't mean you're going on anywhere, right? Mm. You can be moving on the outside, but then inside you're stagnant. And, and you don't know why you hurt and you don't know why, right? You were, you were touched when you were younger. You were molested. You was raped. You know what I'm saying? It could be a, a family friend. You were hurt. You were beat when you were younger. You were rejected and you never dealt with that. So because of the fact that you never dealt with that, now that's dealing with you, right? Mm -hmm. And it's dealing with you in a way, and I always, and I say this because at the bottom is the time, I do it all the time, but especially at the bottom. Self inventory, right? Um, some people are so used to living life as a half or a quarter that they won't even understand what it is to feel whole. It's like you hiking up a mountain all your life, or you running all your life, you got a 20 pound backpack on, and your body just, you've just adapted to having that weight 
to the point where if you ever would take that off, you would have a whole other experience. And I, and I say this because I'm so passionate about this because in terms of we, we bring this full circle of being our brother's keeper, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, when I'm going to say brother, I'm saying when I'm going to be brother, I'm my sister's keeper, all of our keepers. Right. We have to understand that when you are not whole, you are not having a whole life experience, right? You are present, but you're not present. Like you hear, but I say your heart literally has, I look at, I, this is my, my perspective, my model and everything like that. Your heart only has so much space in it, right? Mm -hmm. And if you figure if quarter of your heart is, 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 is still wrestling with trauma and stuff like that, past things, Another part of your heart is wrestling to, to, to recent issues that are unresolved and unaddressed. Another part of your heart is wrestling with the relationship with yourself, right? All of these pieces are space. That means 60% is already taken up, and you only got 40% mm. of your heart to live off of. That's clear. That's clean. It's like having a drain that's only 40% clean. You know what mm. I'm saying? Only 40% clear. The water ain't going to go down the way it's supposed to, not as fast as it should. So yeah, no. you oper you operating, but you're not operating officially, efficiently, and that's what healing and getting whole does. It allows you to operate efficiently the way you're designed to be, right? Like you, you know what I'm saying. The most purest you are is when you come into this world as a child, because you have not been touched with these issues, right? Right. You can operate clearly, purely. You enjoy your life, and then life hits you and it clogs your heart up with things that you have to address that are unaddressed. And unhealed, right? And my thing is, again, from personal experience, the more I've healed, the more I've been able to enjoy my life, mm. right? I, I, and I've been traveling across the country as a speaker, as an artist for the last 13 years at this point, right? And the more, and, I, and I've had some great experiences and not fully ex, ex, um, enjoyed them because I'm mm. like, I'm not free. So imagine you going to your graduation, but you're still in chains. You know what I mean? It's like, how can you fully express yourself? And I would say fully process what's happening if you're only processing that 40% and a whole 60% is blocked up. So you can't have a whole full experience whatsoever. Because when you're vulnerable and when you're intimate, and just not just romantically intimate, vulnerable, intimate, that 60% that's clogged up inside won't let you get fully vulnerable. Won't let you get fully intimate. And then you have this space that's just fooled up and chock full of issues. So you, you I mean, you're only enjoying 40% of your life. You're only, seeing, you're only seeing life through a 40% perspective, right? It's like one eye closed, one eye blind, you only got one eye to see. You know what I'm saying? It's a perspective piece. So that's why I'm so passionate when you when you when you get whole, you can live whole, right? Absolutely. And when you live half, you're only only gonna when you are half, you're only gonna enjoy life as half. So get healed and get whole, especially while you're at the bottom, so that when you climb to the top, you can stay there. And not only can you stay there, now you can pull people up while you're climbing, lifting as you climb, right? But you have to be strong to do that. So it, it's cool to do it when you're at the top, but it's something else to do when you're at the bottom because now you got a fan, foundation to stand on. Right. Right. And I would say this. Uh, I'm just flowing. I would say this. This is so important because while you're in the process of healing, you're at the bottom. Right. Improve yourself. Self-improvement. You know what I'm saying? Um, work on skills. Build skills. Build while you're down there so you can have a foundation to come up on. Right. Um, be honest with yourself. You have to be brutally honest with yourself of why you are where you are and what you need to change. Right. You need to look yourself in the mirror and say, this is, this is where I'm at. Take full accountability and full ownership of whatever you did to contribute to where you are. And at this point, take full accountability and full ownership while you're at the bottom for being at the bottom. Because mm -hmm. now that you're there, yeah, nobody's going to fix it for you. It's your responsibility and obligation to fix it, to fix yourself, complaining about what happened to you, how they hurt you, what they did, it's cool, right? Mm -hmm. It's expressive. Get it out. Because if you yeah. once you 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 need to because no one's gonna buy the sob story anymore. Everybody has a sob story, some deeper than others, right? Right. But now what he did to you ten years ago is not valid in this moment unless you want to stay in that cycle and stay stagnant. Right? right. If you wanna still 
You know what I'm saying? Still getting hit. Forgive people while you're at the bottom. Let it go. Let it go while you're at the bottom. Because why you want? Why you at the bottom? You want to? You want to go back up with the same weight that brought you there to begin with? Forgive mm -hmm. people that hurt you. Mm -hmm. You know, biblically, love those that was it Matthew five forty four. Love those that hurt you. Hurt you. Pray for those that spitefully use you and persecute you. Right? It's literally so that you, you can get get higher. Right? Like I don't want to have wings and still have twenty pound weights on my back. I want to fly. Right? When I forgave my family for bar for um. I gave my family $2,000 in a loan and they never gave it back and it was a payday loan and I was so bitter for so long. But once I started to let go and forgive, all of a sudden, like a, a, couple, a week later, I get a, a letter in the mail said that they have canceled that loan. That's what you let, wow. you, gotta, you gotta give room for God to work in that moment too. So like mm -hmm. one guy says, okay, here's an act of obedience. I'm gonna forgive and let go and watch him work. You know what I'm saying? That is so, so good. So there, while you're at the bottom, you don't got to stay there. Boom. No, you don't. Thank you so much for sharing those words of wisdom to help people to see that there is so much hope available to you when you deal with those tough areas, when you take the time to deal with those areas that are clogged up. It does not feel good all the time but it's worth it in the end. Thank you so much, Frank. No doubt. I appreciate all of you that are watching now and are catching the replay. If you want to catch other episodes of the Live and Share podcast, head over to iliveandshare.com. I'll see you next Saturday at 10 a.m. I'm your girl, Marilyn Shaw, and I will talk with you soon. Peace.